Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to the second session of the Barriers and Benefits to Entrepreneurial Thinking in Government series. My name is Terry Ross. I'm the director of the Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Calgary's Haskins School of Business. The University of Calgary gratefully acknowledges that this event is not only being held in cyberspace, but also on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tutsina First Nations, and the Stody Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Part of our goal at the Hunter Center is to engage business leaders, practitioners, and students in these sort of strategic conversations. And I'd like to thank the University of Calgary School of Public Policy for partnering on this series to help us do just that. Don't forget that we'll be accepting written Q&A throughout today's event. You can submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and be sure to upvote your favorites. We had an incredible response to last week's conversation with renowned author, academic Mariana Mazzucato, and she certainly left us with a lot to think about and discuss. We've got an equally engaging hour ahead with our expert panel who are going to look at entrepreneurial thinking in government through the lens of Alberta and Calgary. We are so excited for what our panelists bring to the table today. I don't have time to read all their bios, but would encourage you to do so and to follow them. They all have a laundry list of things that they're up to, so I'll just introduce them quickly. Jim DeWald, Dean of the University of Calgary's Haskins School of Business. Carol Ann Hilton is the founder and CEO of the Indigenomics Institute in Vancouver. Welcome. Marcia Nelson is a former Deputy Minister of Executive Council in Alberta and is currently an Alberta Blue Cross board member, an executive fellow with both the Haskane School of Business and the School of Public Policy. Jason Ribeiro is a Director of Strategy with Calgary Economic Development. And finally, I'd like to reintroduce our moderator for this series, Dan Wicklum, the President and CEO of the Transition Accelerator and an apt person to help steward this panel through the discussion on the barriers and benefits to entrepreneurial thinking in government. Dan, thank you so much. Take it from here. Well, thank you, really appreciate it. Welcome to all the panelists and welcome to everyone that's out there in um, uh, cyberspace uh, tuning in. Uh, we'll be monitoring the Q's and A's as we go along here. So please put a, a, a question uh, into the stream and, and we'll um, answer that or, or get to those later on in the, uh, it, uh, in, in the event here. I'm just going to flag um, in the speaking notes that Hunter Center put together for me. They talked about that that this concept of inspecting government's role in, uh, in markets and, and investments was timely. And I would just re like, wow, was it timely? I'm not sure if everyone picked it up. Within the last two hours, the government of Canada has has announced an investment of over 10 billion with a B in new infrastructure spending. So you know the things that we're talking about here today in terms of uh, uh, role of government and innovation in government is could not be uh, more pertinent, more timely. So again, this panel follows up on the presentation that was made by uh, Dr. Dr. Mascato uh, last week. If you haven't seen that, is it, it is on YouTube. Um, so you can, you can actually read it or take a look at that if you wish. But let me summarize just very quickly uh, the topics uh, and the outcomes of, of, last, uh, of the last event. So essentially what her thesis is, is that um, governments could be much more innovative and in that we should be pushing back, re-examining this sort of default that we have, especially in Canada and maybe especially in Alberta, that governments can't and shouldn't pick winners and losers, so they shouldn't. And the fact that the government as an institution could be and should be much more important in shaping what the future of our society is like um, through getting, getting much more involved in, in markets, being much more directive and being able to define an outcome about what we want our society to look like and, and how to get there. So the, the barriers that, that she talked about were uh, the barriers of thing, about why governments can't do this is because there's actually no narrative on the role of government to be able to do that. So they actually don't have public license to be able to do that. Uh, she talked about the risk tolerances inside of government, but also risk tolerance being of government being driven by the public. Uh, she talked about, frankly, the erosion or the lack of government capacity to be able to take on this role. Um, even if they wanted the role, maybe they couldn't. Um, she talked about uh, the lack of there being a clear, targeted, measurable, mission-oriented uh, direction. And, and as we uh, you know, talked about this last week, 
and the questions and answers that, that went to her, this really was sort of crystallized into what is the role of government? Why is government here? Uh, do, are, are, are we giving latitude to government to play a sufficiently broad uh, role for society or have we boxed them in in a way where essentially uh, a society is rudderless and just end up uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'd say lurching into the future and attaining a future state that is out of our control. For me, that's really what this comes down to is what are the role of government. So um, maybe we'll just jump uh, right into it here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to uh, Jim uh, and ask him the first question. And within that framing, which is remarkably complex, Jim, um, I'm going to ask you a simple question that's almost impossible to answer. And that is, uh, do we need new thinking? And what would be some elements of that new thinking? Well, thanks so much, Dan. And um, uh, this is such a great topic. And as you say, really perfect timing. So I want to give some context, though. Um, it's very important, I think, for everybody on the panel, for the audience to recognize that I approach a topic like this, you know, frankly, any topic from my position as a business strategy professor. And I look at, and I'm gonna use the example, Alberta as an organization or as a firm. <clears throat> and my own research has found that it's very critical, and I'm gonna talk about the risk tolerance barrier in particular, Dan. Um, my research shows that it's very critical for firms to reinvent themselves and to have a healthy mix of what we call exploitation and exploration. So the idea that sticking to what you've done in the past is somehow a low risk strategy is actually a fallacy. We call that exploiting. But we also know that organizations need to be exploring. They need to be looking for what's the next thing. There's always a tendency for an organization that has been successful to pine for the good old days, if you will. And let me emphasize that is actually a risk taking strategy, not risk adverse, sometimes referred to as driving by looking in the rear view mirror. And that image makes it pretty clear that it's risky because we don't want anybody on the road driving, looking in the rear view mirror. Now, in addition, uh, some will say because there is a pandemic going on, it is time to retreat to the familiar. But again, I have to disagree for two primary reasons. Number one, the pandemic does not slow down progress. It actually accelerates change. <clears throat> There's a very simple reason for this, because in normal times, change is held back primarily by a hesitation for people to adopt. But when there's a traumatic shock like a pandemic that actually drives technological change and we see it right today what we're doing right now an event like this with the number of people on it that wouldn't have happened just a year ago the other thing that's really important when there's something like a disruption of a pandemic is to recognize that people bounce and let me explain that uh, nicholas nazim talib and actually i've got his book here um, the Black Swan Theory Guy, he wrote a book called uh, Anti-Fragile. And essentially what he says, Dan, is that mechanical things, when they break, they're fragile, they break, they're broken. But organic, like muscles, like people, like organization, are anti-fragile, and they bounce, and they can even bounce to better places than where they were. And a saying that captures that is the old saying, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. So in summary, I want to turn this idea of lack of risk tolerance totally on its head and instead suggest it's highly risk-taking to wish for a return to old ways and to not invest heavily in the future, particularly at times like that, like today. And that's uh, what I'm seeing, not necessarily seeing enough of, I'm going to say on a provincial level, but I think we really need. Thanks. Uh, for yeah, great. So typical do all, very strong opinion, uh, clear, uh, succinct. So, uh, Jace, I'll turn to you. And it seems to me that that same question is a is a good one for the panel to sort of uh, focus in on, and maybe we can see a, a breadth of opinion. So, same thing back to you. Does Alberta need new thinking? And if it was, uh, what would it look like? Well, thank you for the question, or technically two questions. Um, and the answer is a cool moderator trick, by the way. So yeah, 
Uh, no worries. Uh, the answer to the first is yes. Uh, does Alberta need new thinking? Yes. Uh, but I want to step back for a moment and uh, be a little bit defensive uh, as an Albertan, as someone who's chosen to leave Eastern Canada to, to live in this province and is now raising my son here with my wife and possessing the perspective, frankly, of having lived and worked in places across the country and the globe, I can confidently tell you that if you pose that same question about another city, state, or country to leaders from that jurisdiction, you'd likely get the same answer I just gave. And, and really, that's why we're here today. Um, Professor Mazzucato's globally recognized work is not just interesting for its application to Alberta, because we happen to be so positively or negatively unique in the grand scheme of things. Uh, we're here because the implications of her work should be spurring very thoughtful discussions, uh, not just here, but across the globe, about how we collectively frame a better system for pursuing sustainable, inclusive, and innovation-led economic growth. Because I believe if we did float the question, are the dominant economic and policy frameworks we've established as a society as good as they can be, I believe the overwhelming answer would be no, here and beyond. Uh, so I wanted to, to quickly introduce that caveat because so many decision makers are, are wrestling with these very uh, same issues. So given that uh, I've established that Alberta uh, needs new thinking, uh, let me quickly introduce uh, potentially two domains in which I believe that thinking needs to occur and to answer your question, what that might look like. So the first I would contend is in response to digital transformation and the fourth industrial revolution. If we can all agree that the game has changed, why would we keep playing with the rules and the equipment of decades ago? Truly, uh, why would we accept in economic or fiscal policy what we wouldn't accept in literally any other realm of life when the stakes are this high? No one would uh, skate for a puck against Johnny Gaudreau with Maurice Richard's skates. So why would we meet a new digital era without uh, new frameworks for, for co-investment, particularly downstream, and long-term public financing for research and development that embraces risks and rewards, uh, uh, both risks and rewards across the innovation chain. Uh, and then the second is the fundamental need to take a, a cross-sectoral approach in addressing these really, really wicked problems facing our province. And I make these uh, remarks not only wearing the hat uh, of the Director of Strategy at Calgary Economic Development, but as a doctoral candidate researching cross-sector partnerships, uh, but also interestingly, interestingly enough as a, as a former political commentator, uh, a smart government and a strong economy go hand in hand. And what has been well documented over the last 40 years is the rising anti-government sentiment that has emerged globally, but particularly in North America. It is you know, proven to be uh, remarkably successful in politics but in every way has hamstrung the ability for, for any government's resulting policy to be overly ambitious, investment and mission oriented, and also left us with uh, unequal growth and, and an alarming debt burden. Uh, so I wanna make clear that smart government doesn't necessarily need to mean big government. And an investment driven public sector does not necessarily mean a big spending public sector that crowds out the private sector. It's about defining these higher level missions uh, in Alberta that matter to us uh, uh, as Albertans and forming the focus partnerships needed to, to execute them. So Mazzucato's framework for mission-oriented policy should be equally appealing to the political left and right and everyone in between in Alberta for its broad focus on adequately funding a strong and creative public service and for being uh, investment-driven in a way that delivers healthy dividends and, and co-creates robust markets uh, for taxpayers. All right, great. Um, I'm actually gonna reference one of the uh, Q's and A's from Gerald. And Jim, it looks like you've got a, a, um, a fan there. Gerald starts off with saying, Jim is bang on, that's always good. Uh, what, and what Gerald goes on to talk about in that, in that Q and A is about culture. It's the culture of gov government. So I wonder if we could sort of play with that a little bit. Caroline, I'll look to you, uh, this notion of, you know, the overarching question is, uh, do we need a new way of thinking? But to follow on that is this notion of public narrative. And it seems to me that government culture and their ability to take risks to some extent is uh, dictated by uh, 
the, the latitude that the public, we as voters, give government in order to innovate and take the risks and so on. And that requires a narrative. So do we need a new way of thinking? And what's the public narrative now in the role of government in, in, in the public policy uh, realm? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. And this is a fantastic conversation. Um, I come from the perspective of building an indigenous, indigenous economic focus here in this conversation. Uh, some of you may have heard of the concept of indigenomics. I describe it as modern indigenous economic design. So I wrote a book called Indigenomics, Taking a Seat at the Economic Table, which essentially centers Canada's narrative within the truth that this country and the regions were formed on systemic Indigenous economic exclusion and that the future and well-being of Canada must be shaped on Indigenous systemic economic inclusion. I also um, position that Canada itself was shaped within the lens of the Indian problem and policy follows within that lens. So I position the question in this discussion, what do we really know about Alberta's Indigenous economy? And in asking that question, the underlying intention, how many First Nations economic development cor corporations are there in Alberta? How many Indigenous businesses are there? What is the size of Indigenous economic impact in the region? How does this compare to previous years or over 10 years? What is the size of the Indigenous labour force here? What are the unemployment rates? How many Indigenous female businesses are there? These all serve as central questions which point to the absence of solid Indigenous economic data sets to understand the evolving growth of the Indigenous economy, specifically in Alberta, as well as equally so within the larger national economy. I want to note the ever-increasing need to understand the regional Indigenous economy but also to center facilitation of positive leadership in economic reconciliation that supports growth and inclusion. Now in asking those questions of what we actually understand about Alberta's indigenous economy, I placed two significant reports. One was the Atlantic region of the collective four provinces, which identified annual contributions of over $2.9 billion annually to those regional economies. Lastly, the Manitoba um, province established that the Indigenous contribution to the econ uh, regional economy was just over $9 billion annually. So in asking this question of new ways of thinking within this public narrative, I positioned the concept that what is essential to support Indigenous economic design as a mechanism for growth is that what is required is the tools and the institutions and the infrastructure to support the Indigenous economy evolution. So when we look at specific tools such as the Alberta Business Investment Fund, the Indigenous Opportunities Fund, what we are seeing is the early construct of the shift from simply programs and services to the infrastructure and the required investment for Indigenous economic design. What I am intending to do with in portraying the realization of the ever-growing Indigenous economy is to locate Alberta's leadership in the national narrative of the evolving $100 billion Indigenous economy that I'm leading here at the Indigenomics Institute. To look at mission-driven policy and utilizing the concept of Indigenomics as modern Indigenous economic design, that is the forward thinking that we need both for reconciliation and to understand the ever-growing impact of the Indigenous economy within the Alberta region. Thank you. Caroline, great comments. Um, you know, you brought sort of a clarity of arguments there that I have an easy time understanding. I you know, appreciate that. I, what I'm going to try to do here is thread in uh, a couple of the Q's and A's uh, to involve the audience. I'm going to say, first of all, um, Jason, you've also got 
uh, a supporter in Colin McLeod. He loved your comments. Um, I see Peter Bulkowski, who was actually quite active at the last event we had, asking questions. Um, this question here he talks about or, and asks about is this, this notion of um, not just looking forward, but having the ability and, and is it not required to look back in history in a framework of understanding what's worked and what has failed in governments. So I, I'm taking that as sort of somehow to embed any type of innovation that we have in the government in a continuous learning uh, framework. And then Pete Fenwick points, I gave a link that is something, uh, a report done by the Canadian Council of Academies. And just a very quick aside, if people don't know the Canadian Council of Academies, it's, a, it's an institution that was set up by the federal government. Um, so it's independent, arm's length from government that has federal funding. And by definition, the inst that institution takes questions from uh, governments, both uh, federal and provincial, and does independent analysis that governments have. So in a very real way, that whole concept, you know, that, that organization, Canadian Council of Academies, was a recognition that governments sometimes uh, don't have the ability to ask an answer, even departmentally, don't have the ability to ha ask and answer independently uh, questions. So by definition, it's almost an outsourcing of a government function that the government has, has uh, institutionalized in this organization, Canadian Council of Academies. So, um, and, and so let me riff on that then and, and look to you, um, Marcia. Marcia's an ex-deputy, um, uniquely placed to talk about government capacities and so on. So same questions for you, uh, Marcia. Do we need to think differently? But especially, you know, what are your thoughts uh, on Alberta government capacity and where that should be going. Thanks, Dan. Well, like everyone else, I'm going to say we do need to think differently. And maybe where I differ a bit is that having been in government, I see governments searching for that new thinking all the time. So to characterize government as a kind of a monolithic behemoth of a single set of thoughts um, is, is too simplistic. I think we all need to understand that government uh, and the con construction of government is a very complex beast. You know, there are, you know, 24 departments, there's 300 agencies, boards and commissions. There are different levels of government. There are, um, you know, political leaders and administrative leaders. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, independent thinking. There's a lot of independent interests. And uh, I think that's a construct we have to keep in mind when we're talking about government. Um, with respect to the Alberta government, you know, I, I would focus on three areas that I think uh, capacity issues uh, need to be uh, focused on and addressed. Uh, the first is increasing government's own policy capacity. The second is increasing its capacity to consult and engage with the broader public. And the third is really around ministerial responsibility and ministerial accountability. So with respect to policy capacity, you know, in the 90s, when uh, the federal government went about cutting its uh, transfers to the provinces, all across the country, you saw uh, the reduction of, of staff, you saw the reduction of uh, certain functions within government. And there came to be, you know, a view, uh, particularly in Alberta, that the role of the public service was uh, to implement policy and the role of the political leaders is, is to develop policy and make decisions about policy. And that had the result of really decreasing Alberta's policy capacity, the, you know, that ability to have lots of smart people in government that have the intellectual you know, capital, the intellectual capacity to be curious and ask questions and, and do the research and connect with experts outside of government. So as you rightly said, Dan, there was a, a great outsourcing across many governments in Canada of their policy capacity. And I think what we saw in sort of the mid 2005, six era was uh, recognition across the country that that has been a mistake. You know, again, going to our, our, uh, our audience member talking about looking, looking back before we move ahead, we had to learn from that. And uh, so you saw efforts all across the country really focused on rebuilding government's policy capacity. And that's not just people, that's, that's culture, that's leadership, that's uh, relationships. So I, I think uh, today, one of the things that the Alberta government really has to think about as it is reshaping itself in our new economic reality is that we really need to make sure uh, 
that we preserve in government uh, the, the capacity to ask the right questions, to, to basically connect with what's going on there in the world and be creative about solutions we're proposing to governments. Secondly, I, I, you know, the, the consultation capacity, um, you know, it's absolutely incredible that uh, we have this range of tools available to us now to connect with citizens in a real time uh, method. And, they, you know, so I think no government has any excuse not to be actually uh, reaching out and trying to gather the advice and the opinions of citizens, because as citizens, we're adults now, right? We, we want to be consulted about our economic future. We want to have a sense of determination around that and not just leave it to governments, you know, in a black room, you know, in a dark room to think this up themselves. So I think the notion that governments need to have a uh, better uh, consultation and engagement capacity built in right from the beginning is absolutely essential. And then the last point I'd make is, is I guess, around ministerial accountability. What we've seen in modern governments is a tremendous tendency to centralize all uh, decision-making authority and really all accountability into a very small group of people at what you would call the center. Right. And that means uh, usually means the premier's office, the prime minister's office, treasury board. You know, in the end, you can say at some points in government, there's about five people running government. And as you know, as I've just said, it's a very complex business. So what happens when you've got very few people trying to manage many, many issues is you get a funnel. Right. You get a very tight kind of capacity or lack of capacity to really deal with all the issues at hand. Uh, people call it limited bandwidth, right? That governments have limited bandwidth. They can only deal with a few issues at a time. And that's because governments have become too overly centralized. And I think one of the things we need to do in order to support innovation, uh, to support new thinking, is to make sure that ministers who are responsible for departments and responsible for you know, advancing all of our interests are actually empowered to get out there and connect with their communities uh, seek the best advice and move that forward. So that, that, that would be my sense of uh, kind of the three things I think governments really need to do in short order. All right, all right, going into the questions here and, and folks keep those questions coming in. We're looking at them for sure. Here's your answer or your, your opportunity to ask the tough things. Uh, and my uh, request is let's make these panelists earn their keep asking the really, the really tough questions. So plus just sort of fun. So let me weave uh, a couple of questions together here. There's a couple of people, I'm looking at Dexter Lamb and I'm looking at, um, there's someone from IRAP. Um, boy, I lost track. Uh, oh yeah, Carl Miller. I, again, it's hypothesizing that this is much about this concept of government culture that in turn is, is really dictated by the public, because the public votes in go uh, governments. Um, so it's this notion of, of government culture being driven or dictated or a function of or resulting from the risk tolerance of, of citizens. Now, let me unpack that into a one, one question. It might be an easy one, I'm not sure. Um, I'm trying to understand, so, so you know, what are the determinants of culture? And um, I, I, this probably whole doctoral thesis that are being written on this, but what about organizational size? So we think of governments as these big bureaucracies, and they are. I mean, the government of Canada is by far the largest organization uh, in this country. So what, to what extent is the structure of an organization, its size and how it's governed, uh, uh, related to its ability to be innovative? And, and so what I'm trying to do is take it out of the, the, pop, the, um, the, the realm of, of government, the conversation. It's really around, regardless of whether it's private sector or private sector, do we have a problem with the size of government and how it's organized that, that these bureaucracies sort of collapse under their own weight because of the systems required to make decisions and you end up being not that innovative simply because of size, quite apart from these other things. Any, any, any thoughts on the panel? I, let me jump in on that one because uh, my view is that uh, I think focusing on size and structures is a bit of a red herring. When you think about how culture is developed, yes, the structures and processes of an organization have a big impact, but really leadership and uh, leadership and culture are, I think, the much stronger determinants of uh, of an organization's organizational culture, 
and really their approach to innovation. So I think large organizations can be very innovative, but you know, it's not the whole organization that's innovated. It can be pockets within that. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I think we, I would look more to um, leadership and uh, versus uh, size. Yeah, Dan, I'd, I'd really like to jump in on that also. And, and uh, first, I want to clarify that, uh, like, I'm, I so appreciate Marsha's comments. And I like her three point, uh, like three legged stool, which I would define as more like, uh, you know, the most powerful V12 engine ever built. If you've got that policy capacity, and you, you have that consultation capacity, ministerial responsibility, you're ready to rock and roll. But you need the driver, you need the leader who's going to move you down the path. And uh, so when questions about changing that, uh, it's not a simple answer, but you need those two elements very much in sync. And um, I, I am very inspired when I look back at, you know, uh, Peter Lougheed's time in Alberta. I'm very inspired when I look at JFK and the moonshot. I'm very inspired when I heard last year at the Distinguished uh, Policy uh, Awards for the School of Public Policy and Jim Gray got up. Jim Gray, whose history is all oil and gas, got up and said, I want us to set a vision by 2030 that our upstream and midstream industries are net zero. Like that's what I'm talking about. Like that's the kind of inspiration that'll really move us uh, into a, a new direction and uh, get this province where we want it to be. Any other comments from the panel? Yeah, I'd just like to jump in right there. And I think the, the points made by Marcia and, and, and Jim are, are well taken, but I think, you know, I do want to go one step further to say, while we, we in many ways romanticize the transformational impacts of the single individuals that, that made that one speech or, or, or that one declaration that set uh, in motion uh, a number of things that either in many cases were already underway, they just provided the voice and the charisma potentially to be able to, to action it. That in and of itself is not a, a sustainable model. We, can, we can't wait you know, every four years or, or however many years for someone to make the right speech at the right time that met the moment in the right way. I think it's part of it. It's an accelerant. But I think we still need, uh, and, and to uh, you know, Dr. Mazzucato's point, we still need to be you know, mission oriented as a, as a society, as, as Albertans. And that is not just one in the, in the hearts of minds of, of one speech. That is something that we need to really focus on outcomes. And I think if we can address that, you know, the outcomes are not what we want, uh, it will sort of spur the new thinking about what could be. And so if we think about the criteria uh, set out by, by Dr. Mazzucato, uh, about these missions, you know, they must engage the public during their, their selection. They must be ambitious but realistic. You know, I don't think that we need to, to, to look too far uh, for examples that we can, we can draw from. Um, you know, at, at CED, our, our mandate is, is literally cross-sectoral in nature in that we work with business, government, and, and community. And, and not to chest thump too much, you know, we are executing a mission that pretty well meets Mazzucato's criteria. And that is our community's economic strategy, Calgary and the new economy. You know, we consulted, we were thinking about these big audacious challenges, but what about right here in our local community? You know, we consulted over 1800 Calgarians. We, we, we powered an audacious vision for Calgary to be the city of choice for the world's best entrepreneurs who are embracing tech to solve the world's greatest challenges, including cleaner energy, safe and secure food, the efficient movement of goods and people and better health solutions. Uh, it's measurable, it's, it's time bound, and it was passed unanimously by city council in, in 2018. So we have all of the pieces in place that would map to what uh, Dr. Mazzucato would define as a mission. We have to think more creatively about financing tools. Well, we're leveraging a pretty interesting financing tool called the Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund, which is $100 million of public dollars aimed at catalyzing economic growth, retention and diversification, employment growth, and an increase to the, to the property tax assessment base, which is particularly vexing in Calgary. So this is not about uh, picking winners and losers. And this is also not about, I think, seeking out, you know, these very romantic suggestions of what could be. There has been some experimentation that we could really scale um, and, and about fulfilling the missions that we've agreed to as Calgarians. 
that fill in key gaps in our ecosystem and, uh, and as Albertans, I should mention. But leverages shared investment uh, across orders of government and the private sector and makes good on a promise that we're doing this together. That's what I think is really going to move move the dial here. So I think our, our province is in need of new thinking, that we need mission-oriented visions uh, or more mission-oriented visions, but that doesn't mean that we can't pursue them now or that we don't have good examples of experimentation that we can scale and reward. And the foundation for all of that should be the, the enough uh, commonality that exists amongst us as Albertans and particularly here as Calgarians to meet the moment with more entrepreneurial innovation and thinking. I, I, th I don't think it's just government. I think all of us really need to rally around that. Interesting. Carol Ann, any, any comments on that or we can move on to the next question? Um, for sure, thank you. So I come from a number of fronts. As the only Indigenous person that was appointed to the Federal Economic Growth Council, we look to today's announcement from the Infrastructure Bank, which identified uh, $10 billion uh, focus. That was a direct outcome of a jolt to the system of a belief that establishing the conditions and requirements for Canada to be um, best able to respond to a rapidly globalizing environment. Those are examples that happen at a national level, but also expressed at the regional level. So we also look to examples such as the digital superclusters, where we're seeing regional engagement, but designed from a government perspective. I also am coming directly from uh, for the BC focus, but the Emerging Economy Task Force, which was a 25-year outlook, but also driving uh, citizen engagement in policy design and that jolt to those systems. So understanding um, in the Maserato talk about the establishment of conditions of smart, sustainable, and innovative, I think that is the primary directives of which being able to reflect on new actions can support new thinking in a broader sense of how um, many people do we engage in this conversation. Thank you. Great, thanks. I'm gonna change direction just a little bit here. It, it strikes me from the Q's and A's and the conversation from the last event and this one here that there's there, one of the key issues again is this notion of the public and the electorate giving governments the latitude to be innovation and, and not punishing governments that try to innovate and have some proportion of the innovation inevitably fail. That's what happens when you, when, when you innovate, not that everything is successful. Um, do we have a good understanding of how governments have either succeeded in this or failed in this concept of innovating and directing in the past? Because it strikes me our public narrative is that governments have never been good at it, ever, no place, and therefore we shouldn't be doing this. That's, that's I, I'm, look, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit inflammatory here to, to prompt some conversation, but I think there's, most people I would think would tend to think that um, that's not the business government uh, should be in, sort of, uh, set the policy, set the regs, provide funding, get out of the way, let the private sector take care of it. You know, m m my null hypothesis is, is that's actually not being fair to government. Um, but uh, panel, what do you think? Well, maybe I'll jump in, Dan. Uh, I mean, I know that's a popular narrative, but uh, Dr. Mazzucato made it very clear that the evidence doesn't support that. In fact, there's lots of areas where government investment has been critical, if not, you know, the crucial cor cornerstone of innovation and growth. And, and I think we have to remember that. And uh, we do want to support that. I, I just wanna say, I really agree with everything Jason said. Um, I think we're all aligned with this. There is a, uh, there's not a risk in terms of uh, necessarily long-term success, but there's a risk in terms of politics because some things that you try to drive are not going to be successful. Some are going to be successful. And I think we have to be uh, careful to make sure that we're going in lots of different um, streams. And um, uh, Tony, I'll, in answer to your question, uh, no, I really don't buy that narrative that uh, governments are just inept at uh, supporting innovation. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that as well, Dan. Please, uh, please. In my experience, um, uh, only the failures get news attention, none of the successes. And I, you know, I could list you know, a, a set of successes a mile long. 
and many of the of the benefits that we uh, see in this province would not have occurred had not government taken a very active role. You know, the challenge goes back to some of this, the, the risk aversion that you're talking about and risk aversion relates to politics. Uh, I, I recall um, when I was Deputy Minister of Innovation and Advanced Education, we were trying to um, basically take uh, Dr. Musicato's advice and provide clarity to the plethora of innovation agencies that exist out there with government's critical priorities, right? Because there's all kinds of, of agencies that have been um, developed and, and mandated to, to do this work. In part, government develops these arms like agencies in order to kind of transfer risk so that when decisions are made, it's not being made by a minister through a political lens, it's being made by you know, a third party uh, or an arm's length agency informed by science and consultation and all these other good things, right? So these agencies were desperately seeking direction from government about what's important to you because there's only so much money in the, you know, that's allocated in the system. So we spent time with health, agriculture, forestry, um, economic development, energy, uh, environment, you know, all, all the, uh, the, the, the sectors of the economy and all those departments and all those ministers to try and develop what our government's, you know, mission statements, right? What are our moonshots that we need to address? You know, classically, you'd think of climate change and emissions reduction. You'd think of, you know, health innovation and, and a variety of things, right? So we developed it. We put it all together. We had the, the accountable ministers in a room and we were trying to get them to make a decision, right? To, to basically get behind something, you know, anything. And uh, those ministers really struggled to do that in part because uh, they were concerned about the politics, you know, making some choices and not in terms of companies, but in terms of goals. And, uh, you know, they were also not empowered, you know, uh, by, by the political system and, and the premier of the day at the time in order to do this work. So, you know, I think the thinking is out there, but we need to make sure that um, the, the equation around risk tolerance is one that is, is, I think, more informed by where we need to go as a province, as opposed to, you know, concern about uh, today's uh, headlines. Great, thanks. Um, I'm gonna to go to a, a question from the audience here, uh, Karen Benzies. This is, this is interesting because I, th I think it, it, coming on the heels of that remarkable presidential debate that we most of us probably tuned into, um, and I take that as sort of a, as a commentary as the state of politics at its worst, um, not trying to say that's what it's like in Canada or in Alberta, but that's politics at its worst. And that is, of course, the environment within which governments have to, to innovate. So what Karen is talking about here is, is this notion of what's the balance between public consultation uh, and action. So, you know, through Professor Madikado's uh, presentation last week and, and several times on the panel here today, people talk about, you know, the ability for governments to innovate, requ innovate requires them to engage, to, if you will, get public license from the public, get good ideas and so on. But we seem to be in this place now where uh, interest groups will definitely use public consultation as a purpose purposely to put a stick in the spokes of progress they will use that uh, to advance their means that's always going to happen and it, it, so we're in this sort of uh, vicious cycle of needing to consult but it, but having a difficult time stopping consultation drawing conclusions and acting so any comments from the panel in terms of of those dynamics or the balance between the need to public to publicly consult and yet at some point uh, act to achieve a mission yeah, I, I'll, I'll jump in and I, I'm sure Carol Ann has uh, a number of thoughts on, on this as well too. Look, I think the, the, the problem with the consultation as it exists currently is that it's not very good. So we can't hold that up as just saying, hey, if we just did more of this thing that we're doing poorly, um, uh, things would be better and the public would be more, more informed. And that goes for all public consultations uh, done across the board. And there was an interesting book released, I think it was a couple of years ago, by Dave Meslin uh, called Teardown, which shows not just how underfunded the public services is engaging uh, thoughtfully, but just the lack of innovation and creativity about how you go uh, about doing that. Think about the experience that you have when you go 
to uh, get something registered or you go to pick up uh, uh, an approval for um, uh, you know, a new home build or something like that, and you walk into maybe a blank walled, very dark, very solid building, that's enough to sort of turn people off from ever wanting to go and engage uh, with, with uh, that entity again. And then think about the private sector and think about all the innovations, not even just within uh, COVID-19, but previously about, you know, I look at the, just across the street here, our, our beautiful uh, Calgary Public Library. And the fact that, you know, simple things like backlighting the, the shelves where books are contained is something that only an Indigo or Adapters would do, but the Calgary Public Library made an effort to do something so small because they said more people check out more books if they're more attractive to look at. Government has to think like that in terms of its engagement with people and being more creative. And I'll just, I'll just uh, follow up uh, on a tail end of the last question, which was, you know, why is there such, this, such a difference within, within government and not the private sector, et cetera? I think when, what, we, what this has come down to, our conversation around leadership and culture, why would we hold particular values in one set about what private sector leadership looks like and not about what public sector leadership looks like if you're managing people and you're managing resources? Uh, there's many of these things that are, are common that we can be looked across. So there's also bad business that is being done. And then there's good business and there's bad governmental investments. And then there's great governmental investments. What we need to really think about is the communications of the difference between the good and the bad and by the confidence and the trustworthiness through sound results of the public to be able to do more uh, instead of less. I've got a comment here and then I'll go back to the panel to see if anyone has uh, sort of comment on this, but I came across some super nifty software about six months ago that's actually out of Scandinavia where um, a company or an organization can engage in real time via their home computers or work computers up to 5,000 people in a structured uh, discussion. And it's all sort of, as you might expect, um, based on an organization wanting to ask their employees or citizenry very specific questions. And as people chat, there's a bots and some live moderation where people of like mind get together in the next phase and they, they keep refining and discussing and they come up with the end result after, you know, even as little as a couple hours is, you know, bucketed uh, answers to the questions and some semblance or some, um, understanding of what proportion of your organization agrees with answer A, B, C, or D to, to the question because they've all been involved in, um, in developing these answers in very real time. So it does strike me that this notion of engagement is so important that maybe uh, we have not kept up uh, with the potential that our new, new technology and tools have us has to, to engage in different ways that might address some of these things. But uh, it, it, back to the panel, any, any, um, any uh, riffing on Jason's comments? Well, I think that the uh, whole topic of uh, consultation is very complex, Dan, because it's not only do you ask, what do you ask, when do you ask, so on and so forth. And at the same time, there is a need for action and for leadership. You know, if you stand back and, and just go up a level and you say, we have to make generational change in what we're doing with our organization, probably the worst idea you could ever have is to say, and by the way, we can change our entire leadership team every four years. Like, <laughs> so in that sense, it's completely crazy how we're structured. So it's tough. All I'm saying is that it's a real balancing act when you get people in, they need to be trying to think long-term, uh, but they're, you know, they're faced with the short-term death, um, possibly. So it's very, very tricky. It's easy to criticize. And I don't know if Marsha has any comments on this, but it's very easy to criticize, but hard to do it the right way. This is called a pregnant pause. <laughs> I, I guess I, I, I'm just thinking absolutely, Jim, I agree with everything you've said. Uh, but even in four year uh, uh, time, limited time cycles, uh, I've seen governments be incredibly innovative and I've seen them suffer alternatively from what I would call consultation constipation, right? Like they just spend all their time consulting uh, and they never finish consulting and it never seems to, you know, go anywhere. And then, you know, their, their, their term is up, but uh, certainly, you know, I've seen, um, uh, great examples of how government has used kind of old methods, but also new tools. 
in order to um, consult and, and develop really important policy. I think about the social policy framework that was developed uh, with uh, Dave Hancock's leadership. And I think there were like, you know, 40,000 people that were involved in the development of that. And that was in the early days of using wikis and, and other kinds of online consultation. You know, the, uh, the climate policy that was developed by uh, the, uh, the recent NDP government used an expert panel. It had public consultations. It had online consultations. It had, you know, a, a whole set of tools that were brought to bear uh, to, you know, to bring action in a really short period of time. And uh, it broadly had, you know, the, the buy-in of uh, the majority of stakeholders at the time. So I think, you know, I, I think there are ways to do this, but you have to be invested uh, uh, in the, both the process and the outcome. And too often, and, you know, I'm sure Carol Ann would have some views of this, that, uh, you know, consultations seem to be done to just check the box as opposed to have a, a, a meaningful and important uh, dialogue that will ultimately change your outcomes. So uh, that, that requires uh, a real buy-in to it. Carol Ann, any thoughts? We've got lots of questions streaming in here, so there's no, no shortage of things to talk about, but any thoughts on that one? Um, for sure. So coming from that Indigenous perspective, at the Institute, in driving a national $100 billion uh, Indigenous economic agenda that says at its foundation, Indigenous peoples are economic powerhouses. I referenced previously of this inherited concept of viewing Indigenous peoples as a problem. So at the $32 billion value of the Indigenous economy currently versus $100 billion Indigenous economy, from that regional perspective, I ask that question to future pace in Indigenous economic reality, how do we make how do we make decisions differently at the policy level, future pacing a economic target? So realizing that combination of investment tools, institution and infrastructure, that's really again what I would bring into this larger discussion of the construct and facilitation of asking this questions of where it is that you're going. Thank you. Great. Um, again, I'm going to Poach from the questions and uh, synthesize one. Jim, what, in your opening statement, um, one of the things that I picked up on was essentially this idea that doing nothing is a decision. So, um, so what does that mean for us, I think, in Alberta, relative to our context in our country and internationally, if other governments are exploring and innovating in ways that we aren't? If we, if we don't do anything, if we just sort of let the tape play out, and that's a conscious decision, as you very much pointed out, what would, where is this likely to end up for, for Alberta? Anyone? I, I, it was your idea, Jim, no, but don't uh, pick on you. Any, anyone? Uh, well, for starters, absolutely, it is a decision to do nothing. I think the other thing that um, we're missing a bit in Alberta is we're incredibly fortunate to have a platform to work off of. We keep thinking... We're not getting enough for our platform, but we should be saying, no, no, we've got this strong foundation. Now what can we do in new areas like Jason's talked about? Um, and we're, we're making a decision by not investing enough in those new areas, and just in my opinion. And I, I just wanna to piggyback on that because I think Jim is exactly, exactly right. And in terms of you know, kind of letting the, the tape play out, you know, there are some signs of, of hope as of late. Uh, the, the recent announcements in Amy and, and the platform not just being, you know, world-class um, uh, energy sector, um, which also spans, you know, you know one of the, the top-ranked global ecosystems in, in clean tech, also within Alberta uh, and in Calgary, a $100 million cre clean resource innovation network um, for, for, seeking, to, for uh, so seeking solutions for, for carbon emissions. So we have a lot of the tools here uh, on that platform, but I, I will even say that, um, you know, to Jim's point, we also have a platform on, on artificial intelligence. Uh, 
um, that is starting to see investment uh, as well from the provincial government and, and is making noise the world, uh, the world abound. And so um, we just need to keep building these platforms and then thinking more creatively about the financing tools that allow us to crowd in investment. You know, one of the biggest challenges that we've seen as of late is lacking foreign direct investment. And while that is, you know, always about a, a little bit of a story that you paint about the investment climate or the investment market, it really is about, well, what are the opportunities for me to invest? And we need to think more creatively about uh, calling people in and not calling people out about how we can attract, uh, you know, uh, folks here to what is, you know, foundationally a very, very good business environment. That's where we can be more creative. That's where I think Mazzucato's work, not in whole, but, but in parts, is very, very intriguing about these new financing methods for the missions that matter to us as Albertans. I, I want to jump in on that one as well, uh, Jason, because, uh, you know, you made the point that, um, you know, there, there's some encouraging signs of late, uh, and certainly with uh, the current Alberta government on, on investing in areas that are going to be critical, you know, to our economic future. And again, that goes back to consultation. You know, the, the current government had a view of, you know, how the world was going to work when it uh, was elected. And uh, it made some decisions to cut, you know, certain uh, incentive programs that uh, many other jurisdictions ha had used very effectively. And I think it left Alberta uh, quite disadvantaged in relation to, for example, the tech sector. And so uh, the government took some time. They listened to a variety of the partners that uh, exist in that space. And then they took, I think, some important steps on establishing programs to make sure those incentives were there. And so, I, again, I think it goes back to that willingness to really... Um, uh, to engage with uh, folks that are affected and to um, and allow it to change your outcomes. And one last little comment I'll make is that the reason why Alberta has uh, uh, an international leadership position in artificial intelligence is because the Alberta government funded that for many, many years. I, w I was, again, deputy of, of innovation advanced education, and we were you know, scraping together, you know, $2 million to provide to the University of Alberta for this exciting work like 10 years ago before anybody thought it was a great idea. Now, all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's fantastic, but that's a clear example of government being willing to invest in something new, something risky, and it was all kind of under the radar until we've had a success story. Good to hear about that. And that story I know well, and I'm frankly proud of as an Albertans. Okay, um, we're getting right down to the wire here. The top voted question from Carl Miller, who proudly wears his uh, NRC IRAP title um, in, in his uh, online uh, presence, basically says this, um, given everything we talked about, what could governments do actually take to take a step in the right direction? So given our time, we've got about probably 30 to 45 seconds per panelist maybe your top one or two things, folks. What could governments actually do to take steps in the right direction here? Who's first? I'll be brave um, uh, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll also be vain and draw from what I said before, uh, which is, uh, you know, governments can, can take a more open innovation approach. Um, the, the fact that we're having this conversation is because we have very clearly defined lines between what is government, what is the private sector, what is community, and otherwise. Uh, those lines are becoming blurred by our challenges. We need to take a cross-sectoral approach that's forward-looking. Open innovation and cross-sectoral. Anyone Dan, else? I'll say, uh, Dan, that uh, no, one, no one ever cut themselves to greatness. This government has to realize there's two sides to the ledger. Bring in the money, invest it wisely, we'll do well. Frugal, being frugal is not always the answer in all situations. Who's, anyone else? Sure, Caroline, okay. um, I believe very strongly that it would be in Alberta's interest to establish an Indigenous economic baseline metric to understand the growing strength of the Indigenous economy. Without that, is essentially floating um, in the water, you don't have the data to support the strength of your Indigenous economic relationship. Build the metrics, build the baseline, and compare that over time. If you, you. So if you don't measure it, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And an Indigenous community is so important for this province, that's got to be front and center for us. And Marcia, last, last word. Well, I, for me, I think it's absolutely critical the government set its priorities. 
uh, be clear about what it is we're trying to achieve. And then you can develop partnerships, you can consult widely, you can gather the best solutions from all over the world and implement them here for our economic prosperity. If you're not crisp and defining where you want to go, you can't get there. So with that, I'm going to thank all the panelists. I'm going to turn it over to Terry Ross. I really enjoyed that, folks. I really appreciate you being on the panel. Terry. Thank you, Dan. And thank you for doing such an outstanding job moderating both panel sessions. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists, Carol Ann, Marsha, Jim, Jason. Thank you so much for participating. You know, I think Albertans and Canadians and Indigenous peoples have many of the elements needed to upgrade our opportunities together. Although the challenges of leadership, community engagement and confidence are real, but we're choosing to develop a more optimistic and innovative approach to government. And I'm very excited about what the future will hold. We'll hope that you'll all look for ways to continue this conversation after the series and, be, and please be sure to respond to us with feedback. We're gonna send out some questionnaires along with links to these events so that we can help uh, organize better events in the future. Thank you to everybody at the Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation and the School for Public Policy. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you and goodbye.